The sermon, which I'd like to give today, is a sort of a sequel to my earlier sermon that I gave some time back on Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Most of the denominations comprising what this world calls Christianity, especially in the Protestant world, seem to take the viewpoint that the old covenant law is somehow done away, that all of the laws, even the Ten Commandments, became obsolete unless specifically repeated in the New Testament. <laughs> and sadly, in 1995, the leaders of the former fellowship of many of us went whole hog, pun very much intended, to accept this mindset. These people got the idea from certain passages in Paul's letters, which at first glance seemed to suggest such. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Oh, here's a passage that they will quote. Paul says here, before, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Does that mean all of the laws are done away? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Here's another one they quote. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 12. Uh, the author of Hebrew, author or author of he authors of Hebrews say here. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. But what do these scriptures really mean? And how can we show that they are being misused by traditional Christianity? In the sermon, we'll take a deep dive into what really happened with the law when the sacrifice of Christ occurred and illustrate, illustrate principles as to how we can distinguish the eternal spiritual law from the temporary and from the temporary ceremonial and civil laws when we read the Old Testament. We might title it nomos. There's a Greek word. Nomos or law, a New Testament word with multiple meanings. A sermon on the on a somewhat similar subject is available on the church's website. It was given about five years ago in Northern California by Mr. Lud Karamijian. That's a good Armenian name. It's entitled, Which Old Covenant Laws Are for New Covenant Christians? I recommend reading the transcript of it for additional information. It's complimentary to the sermon I'm giving here today. The key principle here is that we have to understand that the Greek word nomos, Strong's number 3551, which is the word most often translated law in the New Testament, can have a number of different meanings. Some denominations take the viewpoint that the law as given to Moses is to be considered as an indivisible unit that all the principles stand or fall together. And this assumption, taken together with scriptures, such as the uh, ones that we read earlier in Galatians and Hebrews, this assumption is what they use to justify their belief that the entire Old Testament law is done away. However, such an argument introduces an artificial contradiction between the scriptures that we just read and other scriptures, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said here to the disciples, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 
For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And kingdom of heaven is used in Matthew, where kingdom of God is used in the, in the other gospels. Also, here we read, we read earlier, of course, in Galatians 3, 23 through 25, that the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, and we're no longer under a tutor. But here, in Matthew 5, we read that nothing will pass from the law until heaven and earth pass away. And what about what's said in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10? That's a quote from Jeremiah 31, verse 33. When God says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. That new covenant prophecy. How do we uh, reconcile these passages with the ones that we just read in Galatians and Hebrews that state that there has indeed been a change in the law, with the law that was referred to having been simply a tutor to bring us to Christ? Now we got to a scripture which helps to reconcile these seemingly contradictory scriptures. We'll get to two scriptures that do that. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3 again. A little before the scripture that we read. Verse 19 of Galatians 3, Paul says here, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed shall come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So this law that is being referred to here in Galatians was one that was added because of transgressions. What about these transgressions? Let's turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Paul says here, Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the law that Paul was referring to in the, the verses that we read in Galatians was added because of transgression. And for transgressions to occur, there had to have been a previous law. We're seeing the law is not, the law is not an indivisible unit, as some denominations think it is. These verses clearly imply that a second law was added because of violations of a pre-existing law, and if the law is, that was given to Moses is considered as an indivisible unit, then these verses also contradict one another. As I covered in the previous sermon I gave in this series, the law is divided into three parts. The spiritual law, sometimes called the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. God's spiritual law defines what sin is. Sin is breaking the spiritual law, as we're told in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. The spiritual law that is referred to in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, a verse right before one that we read earlier, is pre-existing. It was given to Moses in the Old Covenant only as a restatement of a law which already existed. 
the spiritual law is eternal. Let's turn back a page or two to Romans chapter 3. We're still in Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Paul says here, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Establish the eternal spiritual law. The ceremonial law was the one which was temporary. Also the civil laws. The spiritual law applies and always applied, not only to Israelites, but also to Gentiles. Let's turn back a page or so to Romans chapter 2, verse 14. We'll start in verse 14 of Romans 2. Paul says here, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by, by nature, do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. There's no way that Paul could have been talking about the ceremonial law here. How and why would Gentiles ever have kept it? It was, it was just for uh, the Israelites under the Old Covenant. Uh, uh, scripture there, uh, relevant scripture there is Amos uh, chapter 1 verse 3 through chapter 2 verse 3, talking about the sins of Gentiles and especially Gentile kings and how they would be held accountable. These were violations of the eternal spiritual law that they, they were going to be held accountable for. By contrast, of course, the ceremonial and sacrificial law and civil law were temporary, given solely to Israel as part of the Old Covenant. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this has been a difficult scripture, but based on what we have already read, on the scriptures we al we've already read, we can see how the scripture makes sense. If we start here in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says here, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. The ceremonial law separated Israelites from Gentiles. Christ abolished that law uh, when he died on the cross, and that, that uh, abolished the law which was the enmity. God's eternal spiritual law remains, uh, applying both to Israelites and Gentiles. <laughs> Though we saw these verses here that we just read in Ephesians are frequently likewise quoted by those who believe that all the law was done away in total disregard of Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. But now that we understand that the, this wall of separation between Israel and the Gentiles was the ceremonial law, which applied to Israel alone, we see here what this seemingly difficult scripture in Ephesians chapter 2 really means. Christ's sacrifice removed the need for the ceremonial and sacrificial law, which was indeed the, law, the wall of separation. As we also covered in the last sermon in the series, the purpose of the civil law, 
was to discourage the spread of sin, to discourage the spread of violation of the spiritual law. And it sets civil penal various civil penalties for breaking different spiritual laws. These penalties were to be levied by a court of law, and in many cases to be carried out by the community. The civil law also included specific commands given to the nation as a whole or to its judges or kings. The civil law ceased to apply after Israel and Judah ceased to be independent nations. There was no longer any government structure to enforce it. Now, as for the ceremonial law, the purpose of the ceremonial law was to remind people through the recurring sacrifices that death is the penalty for sin. And the, the ceremonial law was similarly to deal with sin on a temporary basis until Christ came to pay the ultimate penalty for sin, sin, of course, being trans, uh, transgression of the spiritual law. The ceremonial law was administered by the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. And this ceremonial law was the law which was changed. That was the law which was changed when Christ returned to heaven and assumed his current job as our high priest, replacing the Aaronic priesthood. Remember what Hebrews 7, 12, 7 verse 12 that we read said, when there is a change in the priesthood, there is of necessity a change in the law. So when Christ, as a priest of the order of Melchizedek, went to heaven, uh, resumed, his, uh, resumed his position as high priest, replacing the Aaronic priesthood, there was a change in the law. The ceremonial law became obsolete. The ceremonial law that was administered by the Aaronic priesthood. <laughs> We might just note in passing that in, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, also uh, in Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 14, he heal, uh, Christ healed lepers. He commanded the healed lepers to go to the priest and offer the sacrifice, which was commanded in the ceremonial law in Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1 through 32. Remember, at the time when he was walking the earth, Christ had not been sacrificed yet, so the Old Covenant ceremonial law was still binding at that time. In contrast to the ceremonial law, however, the eternal spiritual law focuses on our individual behavior, our behavior toward God and toward our fellow man. Uh, the spiritual law did not normally involve direct acts by the priesthood, except, except in the role uh, that they had as teachers of the law. The Sabbath and holy days are part of God's eternal spiritual law, whereas the ceremonies that were commanded to be observed on those days under the Old Covenant, those were temporary. They were part of the ceremonial law. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verses 26 through 32 uh, here. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. 
from even, evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Except in one little spot here, there is nothing about the priesthood except where it said an offering was to be made. That little part was ceremonial. The rest of this is part of God's eternal spiritual law. We can contrast the famous chapter in Leviticus chapter 16 earlier with the commands for the different the, for the ceremonies which were to be conducted on the day of atonement under the old covenant this command that we just read with 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 the exception of a few words is eternal the commandment in Leviticus 16 was temporary remember that i said Christ changed the ceremonial law. He didn't completely abolish it. Although the ceremonies and rituals of the old covenant would no longer be required. In line with the change in the priesthood from the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood back to the Melchizedek priesthood, of course, Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ. That's in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, through chapter 7, verse 28. Christ replaced the old covenant Passover ritual of sacrificing and eating a lamb with the new covenant Passover ritual of foot washing, uh, eating the bread, and drinking a little bit of wine. Apparently, it looks as though he was simply restoring the Passover ritual to its original form under the pre-existing Melchizedek priesthood. Let's look at Genesis chapter 14. We, we read this often on the Passover, or, or before, leading up to the Passover. Genesis 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. The pre-incarnate Christ, as in the form of Melchizedek, the priest, presented apparently two elements of the new covenant Passover in here in, in this passage we just read in Genesis, 430 years before the Old Covenant Passover ceremony and the Aaronic priesthood were established. A comparison of, ex and I've gone over this before the Passover also, a, com a reminder here, a comparison of Exodus chapter 12, verse 41, with Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, shows that the events uh, here that we, we just read, uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, through chapter 15, verse 21, they happened on the 14th and 15th of Nisan. Similarly, the Old Covenant ritual of physical circumcision, which marked a person's entrance into the terms of the Old Covenant, was replaced with the ritual of baptism, followed by laying on of hands, indicating one's acceptance of the principles of the new covenant and the circumcision of the heart. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 11, Paul says here, In Christ you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. That's the Sign of the new covenant, just as physical circumcision was the sign of the old. What about Acts 15? What law of Moses 
were the new Gentile converts not to be required to obey. Let's turn to Acts chapter 15. Verse 5 of Acts 15. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. What law of Moses was being referred to? Let's skip down to verse 10, and we note what Peter said about this particular law. Verse 10, Peter said, Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The particular law that was being referred to was a yoke on the neck. But what does the Bible tell us about the commandments that we are required to keep? Let's turn to 1 John. Yeah, keep... keep uh, uh, a handle in uh, Acts 15, but let's turn to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verse 3. John says here, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The commandments we're required to keep are not burdensome. The, the law which uh, the Gentile converts were being told to keep by some was, had been a yoke on the neck of Israel. So what do we, what do we see here? Well, let's mention two companion scriptures for 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, Jesus said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And James chapter 2, verse 12, where we're told that we will be judged by the law of liberty, not a yoke around our neck, but the law of liberty. Clearly, the law which was no longer required to be observed in Acts chapter 15, the law which was a yoke on the neck, which neither our fathers nor we were, be ab would, were able to bear. That was the ceremonial law. Especially, let's look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Physical, the physical circumcision issue was a major part of the question. Verse Acts chapter 15, verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Hey, physical, the requirement of physical circumcision was not part of the new covenant. And they were trying to push the ceremonial law when it, when it, uh, when, uh, when it uh, had been uh, fabricated at the death of Christ. Now, what about these four prohibitions in verse 29 of Acts 15? Well, we'll start in verse 28. Uh, the, uh, the apostles uh, wrote this letter to the Gentile converts. Verse 29 of uh, Acts 15, uh, verse 28 rather, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. <laughs> were the authors of the letter simply, were they saying that these were the only laws that Christians were required to obey? That <laughs> can't be. Because many other scriptures uh, point out the spiritual law is eternal. 
They were simply, rather, here in the, this letter in Acts 15, they were simply pointing out to Gentile Christians that these four particular laws were not ceremonial. They still needed to be observed. There is one issue, haven't discussed yet, which has pro also promoted the belief that all the Old Testament law was given as a unit, that the ceremonial and non-ceremonial laws stand or fall together. This problem is that the spiritual, ceremonial, and civil laws are all intermangled in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Spiritual laws and ceremonial laws are sometimes even combined in the same verse. So how do we figure out which principles are part of God's eternal spiritual law for all mankind and which were temporary laws intended only for Old Covenant Israel? A law is probably ceremonial if it required direct participation by the Levitical priesthood, if it involved a sacrifice, or if it incorporated a ritual. The circumcision ritual, of course, is no longer required under the New Covenant, although physical circumcision is still a good idea for purely health reasons. An example of the combination of a ceremonial law with a spiritual law is the rule of quarantine. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 13. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean, and he shall be unclean. All of the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Quarantine of those with contagious illnesses is still a valid principle, but the quarantine person is no longer to be considered unclean. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, 28, verse 28. Uh, Peter said here, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. <laughs> Quarantined person, you keep him under quarantine, or he should keep himself under quarantine while he's contagious, but he's no longer to be considered unclean. And there certainly is no longer any sacrifice or cleansing ritual with a priest involved. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14. Uh, we'll start about the middle of verse 39. And indeed, if the plague has spread on the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which is the plague, and they shall cast them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped inside all around, and the dust that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and plaster the house. If there is decay or deterioration in our house, calling, <laughs> referring to houses again, we should fix it. But again, there is no ceremonial cleansing ritual involved under, under the new covenant. Similarly, the Sabbath and the holy days are eternal, 
the commandments involving, we went over this with the Day of Atonement a, a little earlier, the commandments involving our individual observance of them did not require any ritual or priestly function. However, the sacrifices and ceremonies commanded to take place on those days indeed were temporary. As I also mentioned in the previous sermon in the series, a law was probably civil if it involved a penalty to be imposed by a court of law and or carried out by the community. The basic law which was violated may be a part of God's eternal spiritual law, but the law establishing the physical penalty for violation of the spiritual law was civil and temporary. An example might be Leviticus chapter 20, a series of verses, verses 9 through 17. Also, a law was generally civil and temporary if it involved a command to the king or to the leader of Israel. The examples of Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, and 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. Another principle, if a law stated in the Old Testament is quoted and used as an example in the New Testament, for us to follow, then such definitely indicates that that law is indeed a part of God's eternal spiritual law, which remains valid under the old covenant. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, Paul used as an example the command that we're to honor our father and mother, pointed out that that is eternal. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. We'll start in verse 9. Paul says here, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? That was, Paul was pointing out that the, the, uh, the church should support the ministry in that regard. The, that that was... Uh, that, that was that expressed the broader intent of the law against muzzling the ox when he was treading out the grain, and that that was a, a part of that was a spiritual law. Being quoted in this manner is a sufficient but not a necessary condition for being part of the spiritual law. Many points of God's spiritual law are never quoted in the New Testament. It is true that the first reference to honoring our parents is simply to one of the Ten Commandments, which unquestionably are part of God's eternal spiritual law. To example of that, Matthew chapter 17. Let's turn there. Right. That, that, is, uh, that is not the scripture that I'm looking for. I made a misprint there. Ah, it is Matthew 19, not a Matthew 17. Matthew 19. That's the account of... Uh, Jesus with the rich young ruler. Uh, if we'll, we'll start in the middle of verse 6, Jesus said to him, 
but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He, the ruler, said to him, Jesus Christ, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Showing the, the commandments are eternal. Part of God's eternal spiritual law. But this where Paul quoted the command about not muzzling the ox. That points out that even one of the more obscure points of the law is not only still valid, but it has even a broader significance than that stated in the actual wording. The command not to muzzle the ox was not ceremonial. It did not involve the Aaronic priesthood. It dealt with individual behavior, and the spirit of the command, as Paul pointed out, has significance well beyond the letter. If a law governs individual behavior, a person's own relationship with God and with fellow human beings, summarized in the two great commandments, which became subdivided in, into the Ten Commandments, and it doesn't fit into the categories, some of the categories I previously mentioned that indicated that it would be ceremonial or civil, then it is probably part of God's eternal spiritual law. A spiritual law can govern a very physical act, like not muzzling the ox. The food laws govern individual physical acts, and they're still valid. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Peter said this several years after the crucifixion of Christ and his ascension to heaven, <laughs> when the ceremonial, the ceremonial law had been abolished for several years. Peter said he had not eaten anything common or unclean. The food laws were still valid. However, a person who violates them is no longer to suffer the ceremonial penalty of being considered unclean himself, <laughs> as was done in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 24. Remember, we read Acts chapter 10, verse 28. 28, we'll read it again. Peter said here, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Although the civil penalties for violation of the spiritual laws specified in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 9 through 17, for example, those penalties no longer hold, but the spiritual laws themselves are still in force. Sometimes the reason behind a particular law is not clear to us. For example, which specific animals are unclean? But we need to obey the law anyway, and God will show us the reason behind it, if and when he chooses. Sometimes a different Bible verse will suggest a possible reason for the law. Let's turn to Le Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 28, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. This verse forbids tattooing. But let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. What is Christ's promise here? He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, 
which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. <laughs> does, when we compare these two verses, does the one we read in Leviticus perhaps indicate the tattooing is forbidden to humans because putting marks on the body is the prerogative of God, <laughs> Suggest, as suggested here in Revelation. We don't know. We'll find out someday. We've seen that the law given to Moses in the Old Testament absolutely cannot be considered as an indivisible unit. To do so, introduces a number of artificial contradictions between different biblical passages that we've read. The law is divided into spiritual or moral, ceremonial, and civil sections. The spiritual law defines sin, applies to all mankind, and is eternal. The ceremonial and civil laws were temporary and applied to Israel under the Old Covenant. Spiritual laws and ceremonial or civil laws are often intermingled in the Bible, sometimes even in the same verse. We need to know how to separate the spiritual laws, which are still binding on us, from the ceremonial and civil laws, which are not. We've gone over a number of criteria for distinguishing among these different types of laws and for recognizing in which category a particular law belongs. So let us go forward, learn and know the spiritual law, and ask for God's help to obey it better in our lives. To keep the commandments, as Christ told us we should do if we wish to enter into eternal life. <laughs>